Thinking Basketball Podcast. My name is Ben. Welcome back to the trade deadline episode, Cody. I mean, it feels like just two or three months ago we were talking about LeBron James breaking the scoring record. I was spending all my time watching Alperin Shengun highlights, and uh, and I don't remember anything before the trade deadline at this point because Kevin Durant now plays for the Phoenix Suns. The Suns were able to acquire Kevin Durant by trading Brooklyn, uh, I think one of their security guards, a bellboy, and a Snickers bar, I believe. I think they threw a player in the deal. I'm not sure. We'll talk about that. We have a lot to sort out, and and I, I think the only way we can do this today is at some point, maybe not maybe not right away, maybe in a few minutes, I need to resort and reorganize my power rankings in my head. I got to figure out who's playing where, how these teams fit, what happened in the West. Are the Suns the favorite? What's going on with the Nuggets? Did the Raptors forget there was a trade deadline today? How, how are you? How are you feeling? How are you doing? This last week, not even week, but like the last four days in NBA years has been like a decade. Like, yep. I mean, honestly, I had a, I had a whole segment. I had like an emotional response to LeBron breaking the record. In that time, Kyrie gets traded. Kyrie plays a game with the Mavericks. And then all these other things happen. I'm like, well, I guess we're not talking about LeBron anymore. And I, it's, it was all just, I was literally like students were in the corner in class talking about the trades. And I'm like, you need to keep me updated on things that are happening. Cause I have no way to, to keep it. It's I'm just, I'm going to be working through all this in real time, Ben. And I can't wait to do that. Uh, I mean, let, let's start, let's start with the big one. The, the, the one that sort of, sort of shook the landscape of the NBA world. Kevin Durant goes to Phoenix and uh, Cody, I, I, I can't tell cause I've been busy doing other stuff and I'm trying to keep track of the trade. So I don't know what the temperature is, but every time I check in, I feel like people are responding to this. Like it's a normal trade that shifted the balance of power. And to me, it's a trade that shifted the balance of power that feels like a like a fleecing. Like, did I, did I, I feel like I'm missing something. I feel like I'm being gaslighted. That's what it feels like. I'm like, wait, where are the other players that the Suns had to give up? To me, so, so the hall here, I don't want to trigger you or anyone in Minnesota with the, with the Rudy Gobert <laughs> draft pick sort of type of trade. Up. Yeah, Just please look please up. look it up for comparison. But the idea here, I think, is, well, you're going to get a bunch of Suns. You're going to get four first-round draft picks from the Phoenix Suns, 2020, 2023, 25, 27, 29. And there's a pick swap in one of the even years as well. And then on top of that, you get Mikhail Bridges and Cam Johnson. But from my perspective, Cody... You tell me what I'm missing. We talked about it a couple weeks ago. I think Kevin Durant is aging incredibly. And health might be the biggest concern, but I think there's a difference between like this guy can't play anymore. He has catastrophic injuries. There's a there's a Lonzo Ball, Zach Levine, Brandon Roy, Yao Ming. There's something going on that concerns us about how long this guy's going to play. And someone like Durant who just looks like yeah, he's he's still very thin. He's still very light out there. Uh, you know, he gets a sprain or something like that here and there. But we talked about it. If Kevin Durant is still 80% of Kevin Durant in in his 36, 37-year-old season, you're really only talking about like one, maybe two good picks that are just like, oh, okay, these might be like top 15 or top 10 picks. I, it just feels like a shockingly low price. That was That was my response. So let's let's actually compare these trades head to head here, because the the Suns trade they trade Mikael Bridges and Cam Johnson, both of them very good players, right? We talked about Mikael Bridges. I was probably a little bit too low on him on our sub All Stars episode, just because, like you said, he's a little overtasked. But as a role player, just you know, tremendous player, great defender, can shoot a little bit of creation. Cam Johnson, knockdown shooter, one of the best shooters in the league. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but very good. And then the four first round picks during this last summer. <laughs> <laughs> but hold on hold on we agree like the the concept of a first round pick is an extraordinarily broad value concept mm -hmm. that is being smushed and compressed into this single dimension and i especially now with the way information is exchanged in nba twitter and woge bombs and it's like they traded two first round picks they traded three 
the, the 25th pick in the draft is not the same thing as the 12th pick, which is, my goodness, not the same thing as the third, second, or first pick. And I feel like if you kind of translate these numbers, or if you go back and look at similar trades historically, what you're left with is like, Phoenix is going to give up because they're going to be good this year. I think they're going to be fine in 2025. Kevin, the difference here is Kevin Durant is under contract for like four more years. So basically you're hoping like what? You get a good pick in 2027 to go with your good pick in 2029. You're talking about like the 20th or 25th pick. That's closer to a second round pick to me. So yeah, keep going. Let's let's compare to the Minnesota deal. But I mean, anytime you trade the player and the team is really good, to me, it completely changes the value. We should not use the language of like, ah, it's a first round pick, like they're all the same. There's like a high end first round pick and there's a low end first round pick. And I see a ton of low end first round picks here. And just the value of the first round pick to me is really strange because it felt like this last summer when first round picks were swinging off. DeJounte Murray got the first round (laughs) picks in this trade. And this trade to get Rudy Gobert Included here are the players, right? The players in the Suns Durant deal are Mikael Bridges and Cam Johnson. For Rudy Gobert, Malik Beasley, Patrick Beverly, Jared Vanderbilt, uh, Walker Kessler, and four first round picks, Ben. It's essentially an equivalent trade. Like maybe you could quibble with the players. I'd probably rather have, uh, you know, Mikael Bridges and Cam Johnson. But again, the four first round picks, it's. I like if we're thinking about the economy of the first round picks and the economy of picks, because again, there were also like three other players that were traded for a total of 15 second round picks. Like that's not an exaggeration. There were three guys that separately were traded for five second round picks. The value and just like the galaxy braining of throwing around these picks is pretty lost on me right now. Like I just, I'm not sure what people are doing with the trades. Yeah. I mean, we don't wade into cap space territory and things like that. That's, that's not our, direction necessarily on this show but um the thing that segues to what we care about is the fact that this was such a low price because the the nets let's stick with the nets for a second they go from being an inner circle championship contender for us the last time we did a power rankings update to today uh, cody i don't know about you but they're just they're just not on the radar anymore like they have a ton of assets they're a fun, interesting young team. They could put together an amazing defense if all of their defensive players played at the same time, which they probably won't ever. Uh, and you can't have 13 wings, and they're obviously selling. So the Nets go from being a team that clearly has the talent to win the title in a league where there's a lot of parity to basically just off the board in a matter of a few weeks. Yeah, that's what I can't get over. Like, we were, I don't even think it was a conversation before. Like, they were rolling along so well. The development of Nick Claxton into this this all-defensive type of player. Ben Simmons, you know, not not showing it offensively, of course. The passing was there. The creation volume wasn't there, but the scoring wasn't. But Kyrie and Durant were just just cooking prior to Durant's injury. And just, Ben, (laughs) I have to ask, has there ever, like, has there ever been a time when an inner circle championship team trades one much less two of their best players that season has that ever happened in nba history i i I can't remember it happening we were were talking right before we recorded the the closest team i could even think of was someone like the 1995 portland trailblazers in a year where it might have looked wide open again the rockets end up winning from the sixth seed, a lot of people thought that would have been the Jazz's season to finally get over the hump with Malone and Stockton. They lost in five games to the Rockets. Uh, five, it was a five-game series, for those who don't remember. Um, the black and white televisions back b- before all series were seven games. But Portland that year was only 24-17 and 17 with Clyde Drexler, but it was one of those things that we talk about all the time now. Their point differential with him was insane. They were like plus seven or so in in margin of victory um and so it might have been one of those things where they didn't realize how close they were the blazers in the early 90s had a number of hyper competitive teams obviously making the finals twice other than that cody just quick off the top of my head like it's hard to remember teams who are really good selling like that and of course selling stars and superstars one superstar let alone two stars because usually those trades happen 
in some kind of disgruntled situation. The player is stuck in a team that's going nowhere or he's at the end of his contract. And in this case, I just I just keep coming back to it. Like Durant, Durant is not at the end of his contract and Durant is still like an MVP level player. It's uh, It's amazing to me. So I think that's what if we're actually just going to analyze Durant being on the Suns right now. You said 80% of peak Durant. It might be higher than that, Ben. I think current Durant might be even higher than 80% Durant. And if that's what we're talking about, we're adding him to a team that, what, two years ago, they were up 2-0 in the finals. Last year, they were a Game 7 weird blunder from making it again to the Western Conference Finals. And I know that everyone was has been writing the Phoenix Suns eulogy for the last year and, you know, the fall of Chris Paul and he hits 37 and it's completely over. But, you know, we talked about him. He's still maybe at a sub-All-Star level. And if he's able to be like... You know, if he's not going to be a main guy behind Devin Booker, all of a sudden he's able to be a main guy between Kevin Durant and Devin Booker. I think that's only going to raise Chris Paul's value because he's going to be able to preserve himself more. So it like helps the Phoenix Suns in a couple of ways. It's like preserving their stars and also bringing in more talent. So, you know, what what do you think about the Phoenix Suns is currently constructed with Kevin Durant? Well, I'm, just to be clear, I meant 2026 Kevin Durant. Would be 80% yep. of peak Durant. I think current Kevin Durant is like 95 to 98% okay. of peak Kevin Durant. I think he's aging wonderfully, as we talked about a couple shows back. And um, I just was stunned at how little they had to give up. So I think the, the first big question is depth and what that rotation looks like in the playoffs beyond Chris Paul, Devin Booker, Kevin Durant, DeAndre Ayton. So... Maybe the fifth starter is Torrey Craig because he's a little bit more defensively inclined than TJ Warren. Maybe TJ Warren comes off the bench. But I think those right there are six players that are going to play in a playoff rotation. They traded Dario Saric as well for um, Baisley, right, to Oklahoma City. This just happened, right, right as we we're about to record, I think. Yeah. That's right, right? They oh, they lost Dario Saric. I'm trying to pull that up right now. But this- so you you just double check that. There's a lot there's a lot going on as we record, but um, I I still yeah, that's what they, happened. They did trade him, right? Yep, yep, that's what happened. Okay, so the seventh player would be Campaign, and then I suppose the eighth player would be Landry Shamit. I think that if everyone's healthy, I think that's probably the rotation that you're going to see. Maybe Biombo gets some minutes in there as a ninth player. And I think if you're a Suns fan, maybe outside of campaign and his reputation, maybe outside of TJ Warren, just overall skill as an offensive player, the rest of those guys off the bench, you may be a little, you don't want 25 minutes a game from Torrey Craig in a big playoff game and those kinds of things. So the depth is a concern, but I've learned that when you're, when your top end is that good, you can fade depth, especially when you get to the game five, game six, game seven of your key series against a championship level team, because Booker and Durant are going to play like 40 to 45 minutes. DeAndre Ayton as a big, if he's not in foul trouble and playing well, he can play 35 minutes a game. So I think that's a thing, but I'm not overly concerned about depth. I think the the bigger weakness potentially with Phoenix is lineup versatility. If they go small, is Durant the five? Who's the four? You lose some of those other forwards to play with. Um, but these are just the negatives. We, we, we're going to have to save some time for the positives because I have a lot of positives coming out of this. I'm interested to see about their size too because what? Out of everyone that you listed, DeAndre Ayton is the only true center left there and even like power forwards like Darius Baisley has been averaging like 15 minutes a game this season he's been like a negative six efficiency guy like just not a guy that's going to be rolling in it's gonna be like oh we're gonna lock him into the playoffs or 25 minutes a game like it doesn't necessarily seem like he's gonna be that sort of player so I don't know when the Suns played against the Bucks in the finals a couple of years ago a big issue was their size like they had a hard time handling somebody like Giannis they had a hard time handling Brooke Lopez and Giannis at the court uh at the same time so I, I don't know if there's anyone on the buyout market like there's always seems to be bigs kind of hanging around that play that that teams can bring in I'll be interested if they're gonna go that direction because that does seem to be a flaw at this point but I mean I don't want to I don't want to hang on that too much because they just they just kind of like cleared the decks to get Durant there and they're like you know what we'll figure this out later because I think like you said their strengths are just 
wow, do they have a lot of growth they can have right now. I mean, you could say that Cam Johnson has essentially been their starting four, but Cam Johnson's been injured and, you know, they had, when they went to the finals, it was Jay Crowder. So it's almost kind of like they just took Mikhail Bridges and swapped him for Kevin Durant. There's a there's an essence of that when you like boil the trade down. And so that's where I think they're so good because if I had a team with Devin Booker and Kevin Durant and I would describe both of those players as hybrids, meaning they have on-ball skills and they have off-ball skills and they're both very strong in each category, especially Durant can shoot and move away from the basketball. Um, I think Durant will fit in with the type of offense and the style of play they like to run in Phoenix. And when I have two hybrids like that, Cody, what I want is another guy who can act as a ballast, can can sort of s- sort of stabilize and steer the ship and take playmaking duties and make good decisions. And oh, looky here, Chris Paul also plays on the team. So that raises the question of whether these guys will be healthy. Um, can they all make it through the playoffs and stay healthy? I don't know, but I think what we've seen in the past is you can survive with a sprained ankle. You can survive with a missed game as long as you play most of the series. And if that's the case, uh, I just think offensively and even both ways, they are, um, they're, they're in the inner circle. They're in the inner circle. It's, it's just completely shifted the landscape of the West. I mean, they absolutely have to be. The Suns were like sort of outside the conversation of being in the inner circle before this and all of a sudden adding an MVP level player. I'm really interested to see the offensive kinds of sets that they run because when I think when I think about like the the healthy Suns and the way that they run offense, they love doing a lot of three man types of actions with Devin Booker, Chris Paul, DeAndre Ayton, right? Um, you know, they have like their Spain pick and rolls or people kind of hanging out in the 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 key area. They're kind of running around each other, curling around, getting these different kinds of screens. So I'm interested to see what they do to bring in this fourth guy now. Uh, uh, just because I know that Mikhail Bridges would often start in the corner and maybe curl around some kind of a pin down to start his action that way. I don't necessarily think that they're just going to take and be like, all right, Kevin Durant, go be Mikhail Bridges right now. You're just going to be uber Mikhail Bridges. Like, that's not Kevin Durant's sort of game. So that's what I'm really excited about is now they have four offensive toys to kind of tinker with and play with here. And I think we're going to see some really interesting stuff. You know, we talked a lot this season so far about just like the imagination and the level, the high level of offensive ingenuity that we're seeing and when we have man the firepower on this team is just ridiculous when it comes to the inside finishers like DeAndre Ayton and then the floor general with Chris Paul and then the hybrid guys and Booker and Durant it's a lot of cool stuff you can do with that that's what I'm going to be most excited to look at as the X's and O's of this team I, I think the brilliance of Kevin Durant as a basketball player is that you can plug him in and make him a supercharged Mikhail Bridges you can plug him in and make him a supercharged Harrison Barnes, and then you just get the extra stuff on top of that. It doesn't really take too much off the table. So in other words, he can play similarly to how Bridges plays in those actions, but he can also be more primary in those actions. He can also be one who makes the decisions and has the ball and makes better passes or is more of a scoring threat to pressure the defense. Oh, and by the way, if you leave him alone and he's the guy who you have to help off and pick and roll and there's a bunch of players in the lane and you kick it to him, now you have Kevin Durant at 46% from three instead of Mikhail Bridges. So I think they're going to be incredibly difficult to guard if that's not obvious. Uh, Cody, Devin Booker, now he's only played a thousand minutes so far this, this season and the Suns offense right now is middle of the pack. Mm -hmm. I think they're 16th in the league, right around league average. Do you know the Suns offensive rating with Devin Booker on the court this season? It's time for some thinking basketball uh, trivia. Are we we talking raw offensive rating? Yeah, raw offensive. I mean, you can give me the percentile or the offensive rating. It doesn't matter. Uh, When Devin Booker's on, I'm going to say it's pretty good. I have a good... I'm going to say like one... Say like a 119. Beautiful. It is 121 in the 97th percentile for, for players on the court. And so I think that's an indicator that Booker, Durant, throw in Chris Paul... Uh, I just think they're going to be very, very hard to guard. So you're talking about a potentially elite playoff offense. And, you know, the defense gets the defense gets more interesting. What kind of lineups can you throw out there? How do you match up? But that's where my next thought goes, which is 
The best team in the West to me, and the last time we did inner circle title contenders, is the Nuggets. And the Nuggets are continuing to actualize, and we're going to talk about the Nuggets in a second, some of the moves they made on the margins here to round out the team. But my first thought when I heard this was, oh boy, because the Nuggets have been vulnerable in the past to these drop killers, these mid-range assassins who can play make, who can say, okay, I'm going to stretch Jokic. That's essentially what they're doing. They're like, here's what's going to happen. If we are going to make you come out and guard us at the three-point line, and then if you want to back off and try to guard the rim, we're also lethal in the mid-range. I mean, last, last year, I think we did a whole episode, Cody, on how Chris Paul and Kevin Durant, those two specific players, were having two of the best mid-range shooting seasons ever, well over 50%. Durant's back at it again this season. So I think the playoffs and very much the Western Conference could be decided this season by matchup strengths and weaknesses. The style makes the fight kind of thing. And it's like, oh man, what what just happened to the Suns-Nuggets dynamic if those are the two best teams in the West on a collision course to meet in the playoffs? You already have me preemptively annoyed at some of the takes that are about it. Because when you take three of the best mid-range shooters in the game and put them together, the amount people will be like, oh, the analytic, a- analytics tells you, Ben, that you need to get to the rim and you need to take threes. Look at the Suns team. They're making, but like, d- you got to contextualize a little bit. Devin Booker and, and Kevin Durant, obviously great three-point shooters. They can get to the rim. They're also like, I think Kevin Durant was shooting like 57% from long mid-range over the last two seasons. 57%. Devin Booker, I don't think he was anywhere near that. He was probably in like the 48% or something like that. Chris Paul was like 53%. And, and like you said, you know, drop coverage the point of it is that you're trying to entice players to pull up and take that shot and those are three guys like if you were to make a top five list of players that you don't want taking pull-up mid-range shots and are actually seeking them out they're in that list right like DeMar DeRozan's also in there somewhere maybe she'll Shea Gill just Alexander but those three are definitely in the top five so you're you're absolutely right I think that's going to make it really tricky for a team like Denver defensively okay we have to talk about the Nuggets and the Clippers and the Mavs and a couple other of the movings and dealings in the Western Conference. But before we wrap up with the with the earth shattering move of the Phoenix Suns, here's here's my lingering question coming out of this. And it it has to do with why I think the price is so small and why this is such a big deal for the Suns to upgrade in this way. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if certain uh, sports books had them as the favorite opening up after the all-star break or tomorrow, whenever they, whenever they put the new odds up, uh, cause they're, they're really legitimately fantastic on paper. Now here's my question, Cody is Kevin Durant in 2023, the best player ever to be traded. The best player you're, you're you talking in season or period best player. I mean, I'll give you period. I'll give you who, who, what other MVP level players get traded in the off season, I mean, now, there's a few I can think of. You're not talking like the the LeBron wink wink. You're going to sign here anyway. No, so that doesn't. Trades, no, right? that doesn't count. It's got to be a real trade. It's got to be. It's going to be an actual trade. How about uh, Kevin Garnett? Kevin Garnett, 2008, is the first one I have written down. And and so maybe you say, okay, 2000 Kevin, 2008 Kevin Garnett is better than Kevin Durant. But the to me, the list of MVP players. That, that's the whole point. The list is so short. So Charles Barkley was traded in 1993, 1992, 1993 from Philadelphia to Phoenix. That was an off-season deal. Garnett was an off-season deal. Shaq at the end of his heyday, 2004 to 2005 in Miami, pairing up with Dwayne Wade. That shifted the, the balance of the league to a certain degree. Although I think Kevin, I, I think Durant right now is better than Shaq was in 2004. Uh, And then before that, the two other big ones that jumped into my mind, just to put this into perspective, a little guy named Kareem Abdul-Jabbar left the Milwaukee Bucks for the Lakers. That was the off season. So I think if we're going mid season, I, (laughs) I kind of feel like Wilt Chamberlain in 1965 Hmm. going from the Warriors back to Philadelphia to join the 76ers. It is just incredibly hard to think of players at this level being traded, period, and especially in the middle of the year. 
it's it's weird because it almost feels like it should be like a knock against you. Like you're like, oh, you wouldn't want to trade an MVP level player, but there's there's so much more going on than just like, oh, we need to get rid of this player for X, Y, Z reasons. Like, I, I don't think it was just on your radar. It all was like, I think we were just talking about this as a thinking basketball group. It's like, what's going on with Durant? Like, oh, he's staying put. Everything else is happening. Boom. It traded. So, man, 65. That's that's, <laughs> that's a long, a long time. time. Yeah. Well, when he showed up, there was that weird report of him showing up with the not talking to the media and having a PR rep. Um, I figured that he, he, he could be gone as well. And we thought the Nets might make another move, but it's, it's an incredible turn of events just in terms of the timing of like, this all happened in what, five days. It was just like, Oh, now, now the Nets are, now the Nets are off the board and the Suns may very well be at the top of the board. Okay. Let's talk can about I, some, yeah, you I have one more thing to say there. The other team, uh, like, do you want to talk about Brooklyn? Like what does Brooklyn do from here? No, no, Brooklyn. Brooklyn's off the board. What? What? What, what do you want to talk about? Brooklyn? They're off the board. It's just, I, I just, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Brooklyn listeners. I just, I'm sorry. I, I don't know what else to say. This is, I, I can't. <laughs> you are inner circle, and I just feel like I need to offer some kind of like, it's okay, my child. Like you will get through this. It's, go-. but it's not. Like this, it's over. Brooklyn's reign is just, it's done. It's over. The scary hours have been. Midnight has struck on scary hours. And the last few years of the what if, is this team going to come together? This is the best offensive trio we've ever seen. It's over. In a poof. We blinked and it's done. Uh, so let's go to the Nuggets. The Nuggets, as far as we know, did not acquire OG Ananobi uh, at the trade deadline. Because as far as we know, OG Ananobi was not traded at the trade deadline. Uh, the Raptors did pick up Jakob Pertl. So an interesting... Interesting move for them to uh, to all of a sudden become buyers when everyone thought they were going to be sellers, zigging when people thought they were zag. Let's talk about the Nuggets. They added Thomas Bryant and essentially moved out Bones Highland and Davon Reed from the, the bench rotation, although neither of those guys, I think, are really, really sort of or were really shaping up to be part of the playoff rotation. So unless unless there's another deal that comes in late after we record, it looks like what they've done in Denver is just shore up the backup center spot for the 8 to 15 minutes a game. Jokic isn't playing in a playoff game. And offensive, I don't know how I feel about it defensively, but offensively, I think it's a massive upgrade for the Nuggets when Jokic goes to the bench. Yeah. What I find weirdest about this, though, is I thought the issue – with Thomas Bryant in LA is that he wanted more minutes with Anthony Davis coming back. Like I'm pretty sure that's what the reports were saying. And so you're going to go to the Nuggets who have a better big man than Anthony Davis. Like the, I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure about the logic there, but Thomas Bryant's been having a pretty wonderful offensive season. Like right now in 800 minutes, averaging 20 points for 75 on plus 13 and a half yeah. true shooting percentage. Plus, where did that come from? That's crazy. Is it, is it LeBron? It can't be all LeBron. Like, not everyone just turns into that. But, I mean, obviously, the offense improving over DeAndre Jordan is just going to be night and day. But like you said, Thomas Bryant's never been known as a defensive guy. And I I don't know. I think that's going to be an interesting part because, again, there doesn't seem to be a defensive counter to some of these maybe mid-range focused teams that might go against the Nuggets. Yeah, so I guess I guess the question is, with what the Nuggets have already, is that enough to kind of... I mean, we don't need to get into all the matchup permutations that they have to go through, but Aaron Gordon, um, we've talked about the size of Michael Porter Jr. I mean, we did a whole thing on the Nuggets defense, but now if you think about matching up specifically with Phoenix at some point in the Western Conference playoffs, is it is it enough to either defend their stars and their style, you know, Booker's 6'4", 6'5", guy plays off ball plays on ball Durant's a big forward can play isolation from the elbow can play off ball can fit into the movement uh sort of schemes and and sets that they like to run in Phoenix is that enough will we see will we see more Christian Brown is the is the KCP Bruce Brown combo enough in terms of also defending some of the pick and roll stuff that we talked about I I don't know, but that's where that's where my mind is right now for for the Nuggets. It's definitely an interesting doubling down on what they have. Like instead of be saying like we're going to try and improve in these specific areas, it's like nope, this is going to be our core. 
things are going right now. I think in the last month, they have like a net rating of plus eight. They might have the best net rating in the last month, I think, of any team in the NBA. So they're just cruising right now. And I think they're just betting on it, right? Seeing if Jamal Murray, like we, we talked about before, Jamal Murray steadily improves throughout the season. And if they can get to that point where they have at least two all-star level players, maybe another sub-all-star with the, the KCP shout-out from last time. And Aaron Gordon, too, he got a shout-out there because he's been playing so well this season. Um, he didn't get it, a shout-out. He got he, He's on the team. Yeah, that's a shout out. Yeah. We shouted out the fact he's that's on a, a team. That's a selection. Okay, so, so I apologize about that. Did we? Did you mention Bones Island? What's going on with Bones Island? Who's he's, he he's gone. Yeah, I said him. He's he's who, out. Who are they getting for him? Do I we think know that? it's just draft picks. I think they just they just somehow moved him for draft. That's all. That's all the information we have at this time. So that's what we're going to go with here. Here's my question to you, Cody. Yeah. If you look at the other teams in the West, the Warriors added Gary Payton the second. Hmm. Mm. basically lost nothing from their rotation. The Pelicans did almost nothing. They uh, moved Devontae Graham, who wasn't in the rotation, essentially, for Josh Richardson, who probably won't be in the rotation, I would assume, uh, maybe plays some sparse minutes or something like that. And then you have the Clippers and the Mavs. Um, As of recording this, the Clippers obviously had the Kyrie Irving trade. They brought in Kyrie Irving. They lost Spencer Dinwiddie. They lost Dorian Finney-Smith. Am I forgetting anyone else? Did, was there another player involved in that? I don't think so. Okay. And then the Clippers made some interesting... The Clippers had a really interesting deadline. The Clippers end up with Bones Highland. They also add Eric Gordon from Houston. They get Mason Plumley, And they give up two of their guards that have been a key part of their rotation. And one of them, a flamethrower from outside, Luke Kennard and Reggie Jackson. When you look at those teams, Dallas, the Clippers, the Pelicans, and the Gary Payton the second Golden State Warriors when Steph Curry comes back. Are any of those teams going in that same tier? I have I'm I'm going Denver and Phoenix in that inner circle tier from the West. You get any other teams in there? Are, are you drawing from are you even thinking about Memphis at this point? Oh, did Memphis do anything at the trade deadline? I don't think they did. Okay. I would keep I said this last time, I would keep Memphis on the on the outside of that. I guess I guess we have to put Memphis in the do nothing category. We'll 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 double check, but I don't think they did anything in terms of their actual rotation. They traded like Danny Green or something, but did they get a rotation player back? Did they I think they got Luke Kennard. Oh, they did get Luke Kennard. Okay. Yeah, Memphis got new Luke Kennard in that. It yeah. was a three 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 team trade there. Okay, I like that for them. He's going to play for them. He is going to play for them. I like that. I still would not have Memphis on the same plane as Denver and uh what's that other team? Phoenix. Phoenix, yeah. yeah I'm, look, <laughs> I'm looking at these other teams and for, first of all, you know, let's actually let's let's talk about the Clippers for a second. What do you think they're doing? I don't know. <laughs> I I like Eric Gordon. Like in the few times that I subjected myself to the Houston Rockets madness. Hey now, hey. B- b- by the way, the Alpern Shangoon video that went up and it was immediately buried by trade deadline stuff. You also go to YouTube and, and watch that. Like when you need to take a break from trade deadline stuff, go and watch that. It's really good. Thank Shangoon you. is fun and he makes he makes the Rockets at least somewhat entertaining. But when I when I did have them on, I was like, oh, Eric Gordon, he's a he's a professional. He he can take some long threes. He's built like a bowling ball, but I don't know, like Reggie Jackson, Kennard, they both looked like good players for the Clippers. And I, I, I'm kind of I'm kind of baffled by this by these moves by them. I don't know what's happening. Yeah, it's confusing to me because Eric Gordon, his his numbers look kind of terrible. <laughs> uh, that that's and, and you say like, well, he's on this situation where we know he's on this this team that's, you know, they would be relegated to a lower division if we had if we had different divisions like it was uh, the Premier League or something. But at the same time, players age, they get older, things change in their body, things change in their game. And even if you just look at Eric Gordon from like 2021, um, on the board we use for Patreon subscribers, patreon.com slash thinking basketball, there's a ton of blue on his on his board meaning 
above the 50th percentile, meaning, you know, 22 points per, per 75, positive efficiency, um, you know, he hits shots, he attacks closeouts, he, he can create a little offense as a secondary or tertiary creator. You look at what's happening this season, Cody, he's played about 1,400 minutes, six, 16 points per 75, below league average. His, sh- his wide open three-point percentage is in the 34th percentile in the league. Um, I feel like it's one of those things where you have to talk yourself into saying, you know, it was just because he was playing in Houston and therefore you, you believe it makes sense that if he goes to a better environment, he's better. But my question is just like, how good is this player at this point in his career kind of thing? Looking at the, the database on thinkingbasketball.net, do you, do you care to take a guess on what Luke Kennard's wide open three point percentage has been in the last three years? Okay. I know it's extremely high. (laughs) Um, I, I, f- I wanted to say 48%, but I legit think it might be higher. What, what's what's the number? 50%, Ben. Yeah. Luke Kennard is shooting 50% on wide open threes. When when you have a team, especially when you have a big man like Avica Zubats, when you have when you have wing players that like to create and get some more space, like Paul George with his, his really slick handle and his loping, awkward steps to get to the basket, you want space. Spacing, I'm pretty sure, and I don't know who's a better spacer than Luke Kennard. Like, I, it's confusing. I'm very sorry to anyone that's heartbroken <laughs> from this because, again, I can't help you with it. Those, those those Paul George steps are not awkward. They are graceful, deliberate, dragging, illegal dragging deceleration. They're gonna have to rewrite this, the rule book because Paul George just drags his legs around the court to break and guide himself like a rudder. The man's a genius. How a dare rudder. you? I'm imagining like an interpretive dance that's like taking on the NBA and somebody doing the Paul George dance. It would just be this. I'm imagining like a swan, like this balletic, like floating around the stage, the lights on you. You're just kind of like limbs all over the place, but in a beautiful way. That That's, that's what I'm getting at. I I kind of feel like I don't know what the heck the Clippers did. I mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I don't know if we if we looked at first of all the Clippers are playing very well and the concept of the Clippers is coming together and if we said hey we've talked about them before in terms of some of their weaknesses in terms of slow footedness in terms of maybe having too many guys that are that are all six nine um, I don't know I mean Plumlee doesn't seem like he addresses what what are they going to try to do play play more like elbow offense through him or something and bones highland i think defensively especially when when the rubber hits the road like i don't think he's going to be a guy that's going to be in your core six man or seven man rotation or kind of your your crunch time lineup permutations that you throw out there against the best opponents so i don't know i i, I don't know what to do with the with the clippers in general now I'm not I'm not in in defense of the Plumley thing, but I do think the being able to switch it up offensively, he does offer a really different look from Zubots because when you talk about that guys that can kind of run that delayed DHO kind of hub, Zubots is not it. Like this is a guy that's really not a great creator. Like you can see there's a couple times where like if if a if a team goes and blitzes or hard hedges against Paul George or Kawhi and they give uh Zubots some of that space in the middle and like a four on three power play, you know, he'll make a basic pass to a cutter, he'll kick it to the corner, but he's not manipulating a defense he's not really taking advantage of that his skills are more like the big drop big sort of thing he gives them that look but I think Plumlee does give them more of that like passing look but um, again he's not really going to be spacing it he himself isn't a scoring threat at all whereas Zubats can be a little bit more of a scorer guy in the in the post scorer guy that was great analysis Ben (laughs) That's um, like that's like I was I was listening to a great episode of JJ Reddick's podcast with Mike Breen, and he talks about how on the on the telecast JJ described a dunk as a dunk shot, <laughs> <laughs> and he was gonna try to try to mix that into his repertoire. Maybe I'll get that into video. You know, great backdoor yeah, I, pass and a and a wonderful dunk shot. A good old fashioned dunk shot. Yes. Like, I think that's how they say it. Like when you go to stats dot NBA or whatever else, I think it's called a dunk shot. In, in the play by play, you mean? Yeah. 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 So that's it. He's just trying to get to there. So I don't know. Uh, Clippers. That was weird. Yeah, I, I mean, I, the thing is, if they didn't get better, they didn't get worse. Are the Clippers as they get healthy? The clip the Clippers are still kind of dangerous with all this all this parody. 
And then at the same time, I, I wonder if people after the Kevin Durant move to Phoenix are no longer seeing parody and maybe starting to see like, okay, if you're going to beat, if you're going to beat Phoenix, if you're going to beat Boston, if you're going to beat clicking and healthy Denver or Milwaukee, you actually have to be pretty good at this point. So I don't, I don't know what I would do with the Clippers. Um, I just feel like all these teams are kind of on the outside looking in when I talk about, or when I think about inner circle, like Dallas, I think Dallas's offense got better. I do like the idea of Dallas's offense against like against certain playoff matchups with Luca and if Kyrie's out there and playing basketball and engaged, I think that will be very effective playoff offense. But the holistic thing is it is it good enough to win three or four series? I don't think so. I think without wading too deep into the waters, I do think that like when we've seen Kyrie really try to prove himself, when he's in a new situation, he's like, I'm going to turn it on and I'm going to commit to this and I'm going to do as well as I can. We've seen a pretty high level basketball player, right? In the in some of these times when Kevin Durant's been out, I thought he's looked really well. He's been scoring like 30 points per game in the last month. Um, I don't know his efficiency, but uh, Kyrie's generally a fairly efficient guy. But next to Luca, we're like we're talking about a genius level basketball player. Next to you know, I know this we're talking seven years ago at this point when he was next to LeBron, but Kyrie still is just one of the best ball handlers we've ever seen. One of the best second side attackers we've ever seen, and his shooting on its own, he creates a lot of spacing that way. That's a lot to handle for a defense. We're not even talking about like a Nuggets level defense where it's like, oh, against a drop team, they're going to be really powerful. That's a really hard team to scheme for because you're just not going to have the defenders that are going to be able to rotate and close out on these guys and stay in front of them. So if we're talking about a league where the offenses probably drive things more at this point, maybe in a playoff situation, it makes them a little bit more deadly. But I actually think the regular season is going to be, um, I think... I, I don't know. Is, is that weird to say that the regular season might be kind of choppier for them, but it makes them a better playoff team? The the other thing, you're kind of talking me into a different direction here. I'm 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 starting to really like what you're selling because the other thing is Maxi Kleba hasn't been playing, and I think mm-hmm. he's such a key part of giving them diversity. You know, you can maybe say he's overtasked to play 38 minutes a game and guard the best big man and be the rim protector and shoot threes. But he did that pretty well in the playoffs last year where we're big Maxi Kleba fans around here in these thinking basketball parts. A lot of a lot of guys on our team um, really like him. And I think for good reason, he comes back and he plays healthy and you get Luka and Kyrie and then you still have the three and D. you still have Reggie Bullock. I guess Tim Hardaway would have to kind of have one of those stretches where he shoots the leather off the basketball basically. But I mean, it's there for the taking, I guess. It's. I thought losing Finney Smith was tough. Why does it feel like Dallas gave up more for Kyrie than the Suns gave up for for Kevin Durant? How many How many picks were in the Kyrie trade? I I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm just saying. Like, I think for what Dallas did last season, the run they put together, a run that we were really all over the, the concept of that team starting in like February or March after the trade deadline last year, not having Finney Smith, like Kleba and Finney Smith were so integral to that to make the defense successful as well. So that's where I'm still a little hesitant, but you know, Maxi hasn't been out there. And if you get some of the, you know, Reggie Bullock, um, Josh Green, I think might be good enough to have good playoff minutes at this point in his career. And Josh Green still plays there, right? I don't oh, yeah. have my crib yeah. he, notes. Of, he, he, he's been looking great lately. I, yeah. The Josh Green experience is just is just so much fun. Yeah. So so I still think four series probably feels like too much to win. But could they could they get back to the conference finals? Could they be really scary and competitive in the playoffs? I can see you've at least talked me into seeing it. Let's put it that way. OK, let's let's pretend let's pretend that in this time that Stephen Curry's out, that the Warriors don't completely tank and they're still able to make the playoffs. We we talked a few episodes ago about just like the enormous mountain they have to climb, not being a top four seed, not being a top three seed, and being an actual championship contender, right? We Neither of us were super high on them. We had some deep concerns. Since then, Klay Thompson's hit like 12 three-pointers in a game. Klay Thompson's dropped like 40-some points. They got Gary Payton, the second back. Draymond Green's still a a genius on defense. 
how are you feeling about Golden State right now? I think GP2 was huge because I yeah. think it they, they, they had depth issues. So they took a guy that wasn't in their rotation and they brought a guy in that's going to be in the rotation if he's healthy. And we know based on last season and how they like to play, he gives them some versatility. I think not having another big they can trust, like Jamichael Green just still, it just it just doesn't work for me. But having another guy that can guard multiple positions, give them slightly different looks and be part of the rotation. And of course, last year, I mean, GP2 in that system, both doing things like playing the point in the zone and just hawking people whenever they needed that done. Just this massive defensive presence. I mean, what were what were his defensive metrics last year? Like he he in a ton of these one number stats, he looked like one of the five best, like mega impactful defensive player of the year kind of impact players and 15 to 22 minutes a game in the playoffs like that. I think it's a pretty big deal for them. I think it I think it is a step forward to the idea of, well, if we're all healthy and Curry comes back and blah, 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 we, we could make a run. I, I still have largely sold off based on what we talked about a couple weeks ago with the league catching up to them. But I thought it was, I thought it, for not being a blockbuster, I thought it was a huge deal for them. Not only that, but he was like playing the five for them offensively at times. Like he was just a weird hybrid player out there. The one thing that, look, I love GPT going to the Warriors, but I'm really, really sad that we didn't get to see Thibel and Gary Payton the second playing on the court. When I saw the Thibel trade to Portland, my first thought is we, this is our new overlord is watching this team on defense. And it was just stripped like before the dream could be realized. It was just taken away from me. Just, just woken up into this nightmare. I think, um, fittingly, let's just put it that way. You said we are truly in the good place. Um, (laughs) so, okay. I think that's everyone in the West, right? Are the, the Pelicans, the Pelicans. Well, we should, we shouldn't forget the Pelicans blockbuster, absolute blockbuster of a deal that just came through for the Pelicans. They are trading Devonte Graham for Josh Richardson. Yep. Probably one player out of the rotation that won't play in the rotation. So let's assume the top of the West, we have the Nuggets and the Suns, like 1A, 1B or something like that. Where would you go after that? Like we talked about a few of these other teams. Who ends up in that that three, four spot? Do you want to try and order them at all? Who do you trust third most in the West at the moment? I can't I can't order them because they all they all go in different directions, right? Like the Clippers still need to get healthier, and then they're very potent and dangerous potentially. The Mavs are still experimental and maybe feel like again they need a they need a run of something. They need they they need Luka Doncic to give us the next level. Right. Or they, they need something to happen. And then the Grizzlies are also really good, but it's I, I would not feel comfortable putting the Grizzlies in at that level of those top two teams. And who's the last one we talked about here? The Warriors. The Warriors, again, I'm not sure their margin of victory is, is their sort of margin of error over opponents is 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 going to be good enough. Um but they all cut in different directions. So I would kind of think about them in that next group. Am I, for, am I forgetting anyone? That feels, God, the West is so amazing, Cody. Sometimes I, I just open up the Western Conference standings and stare at them like they're a beautiful painting. <laughs> and, and looking at the last month's net rating, like we're not even talking about teams like OKC, who's been like a top seven team in the last month. And they're, they're not even like a championship contender, but they're at least going to be in the mix in a way that's going to be, it's still going to be fun. There's still parody in the sense where the playoffs should be super competitive. It's just, I think at this point, we're starting to see like the top end. Flo- we're, we're starting to see the, the, the top end float away. The La- the Lakers got a new roster. How do you feel about it? I still don't know who's on the team. <laughs> they have a completely new roster. Um, it, they have LeBron James yep. and Anthony Davis. I know they got Rui Hachimura because I've seen him play. And then I believe they also have D'Angelo Russell, Malik Beasley, who, I mean, there's a guy who's a great shooter and a really interesting fit around LeBron James. Just as that's like all he does is just like gun, you know, and I, it, it's legit. It's legit. I, he, he's a guy who I feel like will make eight threes in a playoff game if you give him the opportunity. They've also added. 
arguably one of the greatest players of all time, Jared, <laughs> Jared Vanderbilt, oh, yeah. who I think could be lightning in a bottle next to LeBron James and Anthony Davis and just his style of play where it's like, he's not going to beat anyone off the dribble and create offense. He's not a great shooter, but every like unbelievable offensive rebounding and therefore cutting instincts, great versatile defender can throw a little extra passing and, and kind of connective tissue stuff in there like that. I'm really excited about him and, and what he brings to the table. So I don't think it's enough to put them immediately in the, like, I don't think they can get inner circle and that's why we haven't talked about them yet, but I'm, I would not be surprised if they, ha- if they, how to run or something. They have a new team. This is so weird. They have a completely new team. And they have Mo Bamba coming off. Who's at, you know, who's at least going to eat some minutes, some bench minutes. Like he can be a big presence out there. And that's a guy that can stretch out and hit some threes sometimes. Again, the thing with the Lakers is they're just, they're theoretical at this point. Like LeBron, um, by the way, LeBron just broke the all-time scoring record. Not not sure if you saw that um, 10 years ago when it happened. Uh, but, you know, Anthony Davis, if he's healthy, LeBron's healthy, all these guys are rolling. I still am not really sure where that tops them out, but I don't know. I don't see any reason why they don't make the playoffs. Like, they should still be in the mix with these other guys that we talked about. They're probably a tier down from those other teams we were talking about, but I don't think they're completely out of the picture. The the playoff? You don't think they're going to make the playoffs? No, I said Play- I don't. Playoffs? I, I, don't, I said I don't think they're out of the picture. I just think they're a tear down from those other teams. Well, we haven't mentioned the Sacramento Kings, who who are thirty one and twenty three, sitting in the third sitting in the third spot. Um, one of the best offenses in the league. We've talked about them a bunch this year. I think they're very legit. I think they're plenty good. So unless something weird happens health wise, like the Kings are in. Denver and Memphis, they're in. So now you only have five spots left. And we've talked about Dallas. Here comes Phoenix. Here come the Clippers. That's three. The Pelicans are four. Golden State is five. So if you add the Lakers, one of those teams, Cody, will not make the NBA playoffs this season. You can't have nine of them. There's only eight spots. There are 10 spots if we count the play in. And that changes the calculus a little bit more because you just got to get to that 10 spot. And the game's a little bit different. No, no. I'm talking about teams that I think, I think for the spirit of what we're talking about here with the West, you got to be a team that can get in and win a playoff series. It's almost silly at this point to have this many good teams and then say, well, someone could sneak in and the in the play in game. Yeah, who cares? Like they're just going to get steamrolled. They're going to get steamrolled, right? The Nuggets are going to sweep them. So, we're actually talking about I think nine teams whereas we just went through today, at least eight of them. I, I actually as much as I like the Kings, I think just being newcomers to the party, it might be tricky for them to beat one of these teams in a series. But you only get four teams. Only four of these teams get to win a series. So, I guess my question is is the new Laker roster good enough to do that because theoretically if everyone can be healthy and like you can rest and get the best LeBron James you could get you could rest and get that Anthony Davis we saw earlier in the season and you could get the pieces to fit around those guys with what they have that would be a really interesting team in a seven game series in one of these matchups and unfortunately, that's leaving out a couple of other teams we haven't talked about, like the Blazers. Because Damian Lillard has been just, he's been averaging 37 points a game in the last month. And he's shooting just, I think he's shooting 70% true shooting. 37 points per game on 70% true shooting. Like, this guy is just flamethrowing out of his mind at the moment. You're, you're only bringing this up because you're excited about Matisse Thibel getting a ton of running. That's a, that we know we, the jig is up, Cody. We, we know what you were doing there. Let's, uh, it just in the interest of not being here all day, we actually have to stop talking about this and publish the podcast. Unfortunately, we can't do this live. That's, that's how podcasting works. Let's go to the East where there weren't quite as many fireworks. I think now 90% of the all-stars in the league are back in the West the, the, the way it was for all of the 2000s. Really, really interesting strategy there by some of the GMs. So in the East, I have good news for you. Oh. I have very good news for you. What is that? What is that, Ben? The Milwaukee Bucks, despite the loss of Jordan Wara and George Hill, George Hill going back to Indiana for 
the, the, the third, how many times has George Hill been a pacer? Feels like a lot. The Bucks. They added Jay Crowder. And you know what that means, Cody? <laughs> what does that mean? Ben? It means you can get your conference finals tickets ready. Because PJ Tucker and Jay Crowder, for some reason, if they're on your team, you're going to the conference finals. That's that's the analysis. That's how it works. I love that. that that's it. So wh- what about the what about the Heat right now? So is the conference finals in the East going to be Miami versus Milwaukee? No, you need one of those guys, and Milwaukee is clearly – last year it was P.J. Tucker. Oh. Yeah. They, yeah. like, switch back and forth. They like go back one and of forth. Them, okay. Yeah. They can't – has there ever been a time when both of them have been in the conference finals? Well, we don't know. They might be a Clark Kent, kal <laughs> Superman situation. We don't know if they're actually different people. Uh, I, don't, I don't think they've ever been – I don't know. I can't keep track of that off the top of my head. Miami, Miami did, like, nothing – Right, they they traded Dwayne Dedman for some cash. Miami literally acquired cash at the <laughs> at the trade deadline. Cash doesn't average too many points per game. Um, Eastern teams though, Milwaukee. I, this, I don't count the Celtics with they brought in Mike Muscala. I think that's more of a regular season rotation thing. I'm not sure how much he'd play in the playoffs as a as a stretch big curveball kind of option. Brooklyn is just all of a sudden off the board. It's 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 and Brooklyn still has a ton of good players. And depending on what they want to do with them during the rest of the season, it could be like a 2013 Denver Nuggets thing where they're still plenty competitive. But when I look at the Eastern standings now, I think it has to be Boston, Milwaukee, Philadelphia, and Cleveland, and and then a a pretty big gap in terms of possibilities of winning the conference. And most of those teams didn't really really do much the the 76ers brought in Jalen McDaniels mm-hmm. not to be confused with Jaden McDaniels <laughs> so J, Jalen's solid but but uh he's not quite he's not quite the game changer that Jaden is so all the fireworks in the west you look at the east I think you should just be celebrating I mean you you got Jay Crowder on the team uh you must be feeling pretty good I'm I'm confused by the lack of movement in the east just I mean, like Miami, for instance, I feel like Miami's at a point where they kind of had they had to do something to get themselves over the edge. And I know people are talking about Kyle Lowry moving somewhere and whatever else, but they just they just don't have it this year, Ben. Like I'm just really not inspired about watching Miami at all this year. Um, e- even like maybe Cleveland could have made a move. Like I think that's another team that I really really want to kind of shift into the inner circle, but they're just not quite there and I think they could have been there depending on some of the moves and then th- Toronto Ben like we, we can also talk about Tor- we can also talk about Toronto Ben the Clippers of the East so I think the analytical part of the show in terms of in terms of power rankings is behind us it's the Nuggets and the Suns and in the East I would have the Celtics and then as we've said all year if the Bucks are if the Bucks are healthy that that would be my inner sort of title contention um, after that, these teams not doing anything and specifically to, to, to move, to sort of shift the spirit of the conversation a little Cody away from 2023 championship contention, the Raptors and the Bulls specifically mm. kind of standing pat essentially. Well, the Raptors actually, acqui- they, they, they were buyers that it, it confuses me. I do like uh, I do like Jakob Pertl, though. I think I mean I think he's had a down year. I can't tell because it's one of those things where just the Spurs have just been just just not not a great place at the moment. It hurts my soul to see Greg Popovich with a team that's just not that good. But Pertl's rim protection numbers have been steadily declining through the years. Like you go back a couple of years, and he's always been one of those guys that contested some of the most shots near the rim, and he would he would change his opponent's shots by like. I think he peaked maybe around negative 10%. So he would make players shoot about 10 percentage points worse at the rim. In the last couple of years, it's been going down to about seven to about five. And I think this year it's about a negative three. So I think my question with him at this point is, can he, can he reclaim some of that? Can he in a better situation? Cause when you look at the Raptors, like theoretically, that's a really strong defensive core you can put around uh purtle, but you know, the Raptors have kind of looked like a mess. Can he get to that point where he's sort of flirting with being an all defensive sort of player? Does that juice them in any sort of way that gives them a run that they might need to at least make a, a bottom eighth or seventh seed in the playoffs? I don't know. I think the Purtle buy, if you're not going to like sell, sell everything, right? 
I guess it's not a terrible move to bring him in. Yeah, well, just just to be clear, well, we've talked about this before. I think you have to look at those numbers in the context of his team. And the reason why they're probably going down is because the team around him is weaker defensively. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense that d defense is such a coordinated team effort that when your defense is weaker and you have you're replacing all these veterans and star players with young developing players that your ability to have a stat like what's the field goal percentage when I'm the nearest defender is going to move up or down with your team. That's why on our board at thinkingbasketball.net I love to bring up the the entire team. You can bring up the entire team and see how far away a player is from his teammates and peers. So, I still think he's pretty pretty strong in that area but um i mean what's the what's what's the end goal with it i mean if you're if you like what you have and you're building forward it's one thing but it just feels like those two teams chicago and toronto were trying to sh shake things up um make some potentially big moves potentially reset certain things in the organization and they i guess they can still do that in the off season i suppose that was the decision calculus, like if if we don't get a deal that we want, we'll do it in the off season. But that that's just sort of my my lingering impressions of not only did no one big at the top of the East bring immediate uh, sort of talent in to make a big move that way, but even teams like Chicago and Toronto, where you thought some of the pieces may be distributed to contenders, we ended up not getting that. They just um, stayed put basically. I wonder how the Kevin Durant trade kind of changed the, like we talked about earlier, the economics of picks and players and things like that. Because I, I don't know, I guess there just wasn't a a trade package that was available that any of them liked. I, I still bet, I'm still not sure what people think about OG Ananobi. Like I've seen it go across the board to like, this guy is going to change contender because he's a defensive player of the year candidate and probably an all-star level player. And then like, we talked about it and he's not a sub all I was even an all, sub all star in our conversation. I no. don't think he made that conversation. And so I, I'm not sure if there's an overvaluing or an undervaluing. Uh, but I also do think these are two teams that I just don't quite understand why they're not performing better than they are. Like the Raptors team, when you look at the roster and you look at some of the potential and you look at the fit, it feels like it should be better than this. So I don't know if there's sort of like an internal, maybe if we stand pat and just keep doing with this and we maybe bring in the, the, an actual big man that can play some strong defense that'll kind of change some things. I, I'm not really sure. I, I would love I would love to have like some a truth serum conversation with some of these guys to figure out what's going on because I, I honestly am not 100% sure. It, it feels like teams that need resets, um, you know, maybe maybe they sour on the environment or... The coach loses the players a little over time, that that kind of thing. And then you also have injuries. You also have nagging stuff taking place. But um, yeah, we we don't we don't need to drone on for those two fan bases. Any any other big trades or uh, sort of pieces of business we need to get to before we get out of here today? I have a fun fact for you, Ben. <laughs> According to your database, do you know? Uh... Do you know how many Raptors players are shooting above average uh, efficiency right now? Ab le like above league average in above terms of true shooting? Above league average efficiency for true shooting. Oh, um, boy. Three? Lower. <laughs> one. <laughs> the answer is one. Thaddeus Young is the only Raptor that is above average true shooting right now. That's, That's not tough. good, right? You want to be you want to be above average. <laughs> no, I think they're starting to play defense on themselves. I think that they were like, you know what? We're too built for defense. We got to start making it tougher for us to shoot. You know, it's a little too galaxy brain for them. I'm looking at the Eastern Conference standings, Ben. Okay, so doing the same thing that we just did, trying to fit the Lakers into the West. You know, Boston, Locke, Milwaukee, Philly, Cleveland, Miami, New York. They're all probably locks. Brooklyn, it'll be interesting to see. Like, they're right now the fifth seed with 32 wins. Are they going to be able to hang on to that? Because if they if they don't hang on to it and lose it, that means two of the following teams are going to be in the playoffs. Atlanta, Chicago, Toronto, Washington, Indiana. What do you are feel you, about that? Are you suggesting that the Cam Thomas Nets are not going to be able to make the playoffs? <laughs> Sorry, I forgot. He's just going to average 40 points per game in perpetuity and just carry this new defensive roster to the championship. Man, 
our our friend G Simons must be li- <laughs> living on living on seventh heaven with Camp Cam Thomas going for three straight forty point games. Um, I don't know. I don't know. The 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 Cleveland Cavaliers are. It's it's. Has anyone noticed what's happening with Evan Mobley? All of a sudden, all of a sudden, his stats are painting him as good again. The Cavs are like plus eight in net rating in the last month. Um, Cody, we got we got to get out of here. We got to we got to publish this show. We yeah. got to wrap up. Clippers, what are you doing? What are you doing? Clipp- <laughs> Clippers, what are you doing? That's your final thought. It's my final thought. If you want to support this this show and all things thinking basketball, check out patreon.com slash thinking basketball. We do have that LeBron video this week in the NBA app looking at his scoring evolution over the years. That was a lot of fun to put together and almost as fun. I would say somewhere between three and seven percent as fun as getting to watch Alperin Shengun play basketball for the Houston Rockets, put together a video on him for the Thinking Basketball YouTube channel, uh, patreon.com slash thinking basketball. It's the best way to support us. Otherwise, I hope you've recovered and and settled and kind of put all the pieces together from the trade deadline. I'm still trying to figure out who plays for whom. Cody is going to go celebrate after this because he's just locked in for the Eastern Conference Finals this year, no matter what happens. And... Uh, that's it. I uh, hope hope you enjoyed it and as always uh, I hope you are having a great day. <laughs>